Okay, everyone, I, we are going to get started. I first want to say hello um, and thank you all for coming uh, and taking the time out of your busy days to attend this webinar titled Humanitarian Hindsight, the impact of COVID-19 on the provisions of humanitarian aid. We have people from all around the world, which is great. Um, my name is Ariel Rosenthal and I will be the moderator for this webinar. I'm a student at McGill University and I'm studying international development and Latin Ameri American and Caribbean studies. And I'm also a research analyst with uh, Nonviolence International New York. Nonviolence International is an organization that has offices around the world that are focused on finding nonviolent solutions to local and global conflicts. The office in New York's main focus is building links between the United Nations and civil society organizations around the globe. I am part of the civil society engagement team where our focus this summer was to develop a project of which we select a topic and media format that engages with civil society relating to the sustainable development goals. I decided on this webinar as I was discussing with a friend of mine who has worked in the humanitarian sector for over 30 years. And we were discussing about the impacts that we have both felt by the COVID-19 pandemic. We began talking about the impact about her work and that of her colleagues. When I realized that I really wanted to learn more about these challenges that the humanitarian sector has faced and how they have adapted to the pandemic. And so when I had the opportunity for this project, I, want, I realized that I, not only I could learn more, but I could also raise awareness to these challenges. Before I continue, I'd like to take a moment to define two key terms for this webinar. The first term is humanitarian assistance, which is defined as aid that seeks to save lives and alleviate suffering of a crisis affected population. And the second is a humanitarian. A humanitarian is a person who is involved in or connected with improving people's lives and reducing suffering. The other day I read a staggering statistic by the World Food Program in the report that they released in April that detailed that due to COVID-19, the number of people suffering acute hunger will increase to 265 million people in 2020. This is almost double the numbers in 2019 of 135 million. This is only one statistic of many that illustrate that the work of humanitarians is needed now more than ever. And is that with my greatest honor that I'm joined today by four humanitarians who, who will be discussing four fronts that the humanitarian sector has been impacted. We'll, we will begin with our first speaker, Rachel Cadell Monroe, discussing humanitarian funding. Rachel Cadell Monroe is a lawyer and an activist specializing in humanitarian assistance, global health, governance, and bioethics. She is passionate about social justice and finding ways to show humanity and solidarity for people in our planet. In 2018, Rachel founded the Sea Change Initiative, a nonprofit organization which, work, which works with a radical community first approach to health to promote principles of community, self empowerment, and solidarity. This initiative builds on Rachel's long history of humanitarian work, which began in 1989 when she left her legal practice to work on indigenous rights and East Timorese independence with grassroots organizations in Indonesia. From there, Rachel joined Médecins Sans Frontières, also known as MSF, and headed various emergency humanitarian missions in Djibouti, Rwanda, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. After becoming program director of MSF Canada, she was appointed regional humanitarian affairs advisor for Latin America based in Costa Rica. She also led the MSF access to Médecins campaign in Canada into, until 2007. Most recently, Rachel has served as a director on MSF's International Board, its highest governance platform. In 2013, Rachel was invited to be a professor of practice at McGill University, where she lectures on international development, humanitarian action, and access, and access to medicines. She also completed her LLM in bioethics at McGill. Thank you so much, Rachel, and you now have the floor. Thanks, Ariel. That is such a long introduction. It makes me feel very ancient. <laughs> I'm really happy. I'm really happy to be here. Um, and thanks very much for the invitation. I'm just going to share my screen, and uh, 
Hopefully this will all work beautifully. Share. And then I need to just put this on slideshow. So from the start. Here we go. So thanks, Ariel, for organizing this and all the effort that you've put into it. And uh, well, it's very nice to be here and able to present with such a, a wonderful panel of people. So I'm actually more looking forward to hearing them than myself. Um, and uh, it's great to have all these people who've, who've come to join us. So I, you said that I was going to talk about humanitarian funding. I think I'm going to be a little bit more broad than that. What I really wanted to do today was in, you know, we've got 10 minutes um, to really try to talk about you know, what is what is it COVID-19 shown us about humanitarian action? That's basically what I want to talk about. And what is it unearthed about humanitarian action and our approach to humanitarian action? And I want to be a little bit radical in the things that I say. And I'm very happy for my fellow panelists and anyone else to challenge uh, my thoughts. But I want to do that to really stimulate the debate, because I think, if anything, COVID-19 has provided us a window of opportunity to really challenge the way that we think about many, many things. And for me, humanitarian action is, is one of them. I often these days am talking about COVID-19 as the ultimate disruptor. You know, we've seen how it's devastated the lives of different communities, of individuals. We've also seen how governments have reacted in a knee-jerk way often, um, bringing in very archaic public health policies, which don't seem to um, bear much relevance to our, to our world today. We've seen a lot of very draconian measures brought in, very generic measures, which often don't um, address the um, particularities of different situations and different peoples. And we've seen a real lack of um, emergency preparedness on ground level and a very distinct lack of solidarity with this growth of nationalism and you know, countries buying up the supplies of the vaccines for themselves and not wanting to share and not, you know, all these different approaches everywhere and really a very stunning lack of solidarity between countries on this. And I think COVID is also, um, revealed or exposed multiple pandemics which were already ongoing. So things like the pandemic of racism that we have globally, the pandemic of poverty. These are nothing new. These are things that have been going on for decades, but they've really come to the surface again in new ways. And then of course, there's the whole climate and environmental destruction issue that we have that has again been exposed by, by this crisis. So I think it's, there are many very difficult things and I'm sure many of the panelists are going to be discussing, but I also think that there is an opportunity which it behoves us to take, which is to see how we can have a paradigm shift in the way that we do things, how we make policy. And I think that COVID-19 by exposing the unspoken and revealing what we have preferred to leave unseen, we really have the opportunity to change. But I have to say it's a small opportunity. These windows last for a very little time and we really have to seize it and quickly. So let's see what the problem is. Uh, kind of just my statement, if you like, is that the current humanitarian uh, emergency response model seems to be creaking. It seems to be outdated and it even could be part of the problem. And is it, my question, contributing, in fact, to the multiple pandemics that we're seeing today? So I wanted to give, show you um, Deba. Um, she's a woman who lives in Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, as Ariel mentioned, this is a country that I've had a, a long history with. I first went there in 1993, and I was working then with people who were displaced by conflict. It was a Masisi war. It was a precursor to the genocide in Rwanda. I stayed there uh, all during the genocide between Rwanda and, and Goma. And then I was there again in 96, 97, when there was a civil war. And then I went back 20 years later in 2014 and saw, again, the massive amounts of displaced people uh, only growing in the eastern side of Democratic Republic of Congo. And then when I went back in 2019 for the 25 year um, commemoration of the genocide when I crossed the border into uh, Democratic Republic of Congo from Rwanda, it was absolutely striking the difference in 20 years 
from the genocide to today, how Rwanda had put itself back on its feet and how Diaz was still sliding backwards. And I show this picture of Diba because Diba was living in a small camp in Bulengo, very near Goma. And she has been through the past 25 years. I've had the luxury of going in and out, but she's had to live through all of that. And today she's still living in a shack like this with her family. So my question is, what really have we done as humanitarians in DRC? What have we been able to do? And what is, is this really as good as we can do in 25 years and volume of aid? We have to know that you know since 1989, uh, humanitarian assistance has grown from around half a billion dollars a year to over $22 billion a year in 2018. When I was last in Goma, I was at the restaurants uh, along the side of the lake, and as I got to one of them, there were 50 white land cruisers. I decided to count them. There were 50 white land cruisers from international organizations sitting outside those restaurants. And meanwhile, 20 minutes down the road, Diba was sitting in a camp where food, aid, food assistance had been cut um, and their living conditions remained like this. And that contrast for me was absolutely horrifying and reminded me of those of the amazing book by Hancock of 1989, where he talks about the Lord of poverty, Lords of Poverty, which is still probably one of the classic texts on the, um, the realities of aid. So COVID-19 has also helped in unmasking, again, some of those things that we like to leave unseen. We've seen that the current model of humanitarian assistance where we move ex uh, foreigners from country A to country B to bring assistance or to do the work is not working. People were not able to travel. So countries were left alone. We've seen again this divide between the so-called national staff and international staff who have different conditions of work and different lifestyles. We've seen how power has really remained in the North, in the Western societies. We've seen a perpetuation of the North-South divide um, and nationalistic tendencies. This whole sort of polemic of the you and us, and we've seen how that is simply not working in COVID-19. We've seen um, that humanitarian aid is often ignoring the inequities in our own rich societies and many of our organizations have ended up having to respond in their own countries. And we've seen how a lot of the policies that we try to put in place to deal with COVID-19 really generalizes on population-based needs and really loses that granularity of different people requiring different things. A lot of this and a lot of people will talk about the fact that humanitarian assistance is based on a model of colonialism and colonialism is built in to the humanitarian model. We see how a lot of responses to the international crises are organized on a fast phase, top down and resource heavy basis. And often in this model of universal governance that we have, the, you know, the humanitarian responses are driven by specialized UN agencies, by the big international NGOs. And often um, a lot of the specialization around the sponsors means that you know, aid is delivered with a, a medicalized approach or it still comes with a, a water-based approach. It's sort of this diagnosis and intervention kind of way of doing it. Um, and at the same time, the humanitarian system doesn't have enough resources. It's suffering a lot of undercapacity, uh, under underfinanced by countries. So it's trying to achieve such enormous noble goals, but with a very little support, with inadequate support and backdrop. And it can't go without saying that the humanitarian industry on its own has some serious problems that we've seen inside it. It's a reflection of our society. We've seen how there was a UN sex child ring that was reported in Haiti. We've seen how what happened in Oxfam with the staff where survivors of the earthquakes were being paid for sex. And very recently in my own, the organization that I'm the closest to, there was a whole call about uh, MSF being institutionally racist and that it was time to deal with that. So with these kind of issues going on, what are we going to do? What are we talking about in terms of solutions? I think that COVID-19 has shown us that communities are really at the front lines of the crisis. 
COVID-19 has exacerbated hugely existing vulnerabilities, so communities who are already very vulnerable pre-pandemic now face even greater risk. And it's also a great opportunity for systemic change. I want to remind people about the localization debate that was sort of really championed at the World Health Summit a few years ago. That debate is something that's ongoing, but I really wanted with Sea Change to try to bring that down onto a very human level. First of all, by going away from the term localization, which is a very, for me, a very bureaucratic word that doesn't really mean very much to people, and really start to talk about practical solutions that communities can do themselves, how they can empower themselves to be able to respond. And I talk more about a community first approach. Because a lot of people talk about we need a community centered, we need community led, we need community driven ways of doing things. Um, and we, so the community first is appealing to that. Um, while we talk a lot about it, what I felt was that there were actually some very few, um, or there were insufficient practical solutions that were being presented. So I want to tell the story very quickly of Clyde River and Nunavut. This is the first community that we started working with. It's an Inuit community in the north of Canada, in the, uh, above the Arctic Circle. And this was a community we've been working with for some years um, on tuberculosis, where we have an epidemic uh, going on there. Uh, Inuit are 300 times more likely to get tuberculosis than any other um, Canadian-born non-Indigenous person. So when COVID-19 struck, very similar sort of disease, the community extremely concerned. So they asked us, can you work with us to develop ways that we can prepare ourselves, that we can organize ourselves and that we can respond if COVID-19 came in? And so we set up um, an emergency plan in the community. The community started to deliver, as you can see here, food baskets to the most vulnerable people in the, in the uh, community. They started to prepare alternative education so the children could do it at home. And they had this, you see the kids with the masks, but they were all making homemade masks. So now the whole community is walking around with masks. And this, um, the community felt extremely empowered by having this emergency plan. And they said, we want to be able to share that with other communities. And so from that, we developed something called the Community First COVID-19 Roadmap, which is really uh, tools and resources prepared by and for communities to empower themselves to be able to organize, prepare, and respond to COVID-19. And now this tool is being used uh, in many countries in, in Latin America, as well as here in Canada, in some indigenous communities and up in the north. And this is just one example of a tool that is really about empowering the community to be able to respond and not having to wait for someone to come in to, to do it for them. And especially where communities are isolated and vulnerable and they often don't have access to these kind of resources or they are tra traditionally or historically left to the side or marginalized in any of the response or when you have this very national generic kind of response it doesn't respond to the very specific needs of say an indigenous community who has a different view on health than say a non-indigenous community or for a migrant community um, who is living in a country and are not able to access the regular health system so all these communities that fall um, to the side or are underserved by the existing health system. Um, so that's what we do. I just want to end with that. I'm not saying that this approach is the answer to humanitarian action, but I think it starts to show how communities can really um, take part in describing and understanding what a future of humanitarian action can look like and how can communities be empowered and take an active role in designing, developing and implementing uh, responses to um, health emergencies like the one we've seen with COVID-19. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that presentation. and critiquing the where the humanitarian um, sector where there are the inequalities and the disparities in providing assistance and then also sharing your community first response and the stories of Deba and of Clyde River. Um, we'll now move on to our next speaker 
um, Francisco Garrido, who will be discussing humanitarian response. Francisco Garrido has been employed by the UN World Food Program since 2011. He works as a logistics officer in the United Nations Humanitarian Response Depot Unit, where he is the manager of logistics operations, including logistic, logistics assets, in order to ensure timely and cost-effective delivery of WFP and UNHRD cargo. He coordinates all related transportation service suppliers, and he is responsible for effective management of the WFP fleet. Further, he liaisons with various WFP offices in order to determine the most efficient mode of calling forward commodities. He has coordinated the dispatch of aid from Panama for Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Matthew, the floods in Paraguay, the Ecuador earthquake, and the current COVID-19 response. He has been deployed to the Ebola emergency in West Africa, the Ethiopian drought, to Bangladesh for the Rohingya refugee operation, the, to the Bahamas for Hurricane Dorian, and assigned to log the logistics capacity assessment missions in Jamaica, Costa Rica, and the Dominican Republic. Francisco received his bachelor's in transport, ports, terminals, and administration engineering from Universidad Maritima de Chile in 2001, and his master's in business administration from Universidad Santa Maria la Antigua in Panama in 2011. Um, so Francisco, uh, it is now your turn. <laughs> Uh, hi, everyone, and thanks, Ariel, for the invitation. Wow, wow, wow what an introduction. <laughs> um, well, um, let me share the screen. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, I have a PowerPoint here for, are you seeing my screen? Okay. Basically, uh, thanks to everyone and the participants of this webinar um, for 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 uh, looking at basically my my share on this. This will be on the logistics side and the operations. Uh, what we are doing in logistics, what's the supports we are doing from the WFP side, what's the bilateral services we are providing, and what we call also the emergency service marketplace for all the humanitarian organizations. Uh, WFP, it's working alongside with a lot of, of, of uh, NGOs, governments, partnerships, because due to the extreme and commercial disruption on the market, specifically on the COVID, COVID related uh, items, uh, we're working uh, to establish a supply chain services on, the, on behalf of these humanitarian actors. Uh, this is also to align the, for example, the request uh, related to COVID. Here we have uh, a UNHRD. The UNHRD is uh, part of the work program who has uh, six humanitarian response depots, strategically positioned around the world. From east to the west, we have uh, uh, depots in Malaysia. Dubai, Italy, Ghana, Spain, and Panama. But due to the COVID response, there's some challenges right now. So now on this uh, service provision, we integrated three new global uh, distribution hubs. One position in Guangzhou, China, one in Lieja, Belgium, and another one in Dubai. This is the map where, where we, are, we are using for the distribution of the logistic services. Guangzhou, Dubai, and Lieja, and Lieja, sorry. And then we redistribute to the, to the, to the, to the, to the regional hubs based also in the Accra. And also we have one in Johannesburg and one in Addis. This is not part of the UNHRD, but they are integrated with WFP supply chain services. Okay, uh, Ariel shared with me some 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 big questions on the, on the on the impact of COVID, and I was trying to develop all the the challenges on everyone, of, basically on the supply chain activities. Uh, for supply chain activities, basically related to COVID, uh, one of the challenges is the type of stocks and their specifications. Who has the capacity to to produce this type of of, of stocks? 
Right now, the biggest partner that's uh, using the services, right, is the w is WHO, or here in Latin American region is through Pan American Health Organization, who is also part of WHO. So we rely on them on 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 all the certifications, all the the of course the procurement process, the market availability. Most of the items are usually procured in China through our one Sioux distribution center. Also, in order to have a uh, equitative uh, product, also we have to check on the price and value. But uh, which one of us at the at the first stage of COVID impact, they were selling a lot of masks, a lot of value, a lot of prices around the world. So now uh, through this uh, service, they're, they're trying to align to procure using competitive process and then redistribute into the to the to the regions to the regions another challenge that we have also it's the importation and exportation documentation as 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 Rachel mentioned there's a I, I might agree with you there's sometimes lack of solidarity on the on the on the way how to to redistribute uh things around the world sometimes for example we can get congestions on the exportation documents so that will affect the transit time of the of the supplies and uh, that also is a challenge uh, there's another challenge on on the transporters we know some companies also close due to covid situation there are some few uh, operators right now in the market so we have also to to allocate who are the best ones for for the logistics for logistics to get on board and move the, the stocks to the regional depots. Um, here locally, for example, I have the, the airport operation hours. That's a big challenge here in Panama. Uh, for example, the national regulation customs will only work up to 1, 1 p.m., 13 hours locally. So I have to, to get some friends over there so, so they can give us some extra hours so they can provide that, that clearance to the cargo. Uh, airport operation towers are also reduced. So that's a, a part of the challenge that, that we are facing now to, 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 this, to this emergency response. This is a global emergency response. Um, another challenge that we also have is reliable data. There's a lot of uh, decision makers. We have to also have a lot of coordinations with different actors. And in this case, we can, we can mention one example, we have our, our headquarters in Rome. There's also decision-making process with the team in, in Geneva. And there's also the decision process making from the team here in the regional, in the regional area. So we have to coordinate with, three, with three, three different sites, Rome, Geneva, Washington, in order to have uh, a, a good decision, a de decision for the distribution of the, of the stocks. Uh, one of the other uh, challenges that we face is the augmentation of staff capacity. Uh, here in Panama, uh, we were only five staff at the, at, at, the, at the beginning. Now we are around 15 staff because we have to augment the capacity. We're managing around 3,000 cubic meters of cargo in two weeks, uh, dispatching cargo all over the places in the region. Uh, one also one other challenge that we have is uh, training during emergencies. As we are augmenting staff, of course, sometimes staff doesn't know the, their their roles and the, the SOPs, the standard operating procedures, and they learn the corporate procedures. We have to also train. We have to take out time from what we are doing to help them also for training and do our 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 best in these operations. Uh, responding to the region. Okay, uh, for responding in the region, we have to went, going through different uh, options. We are doing air, sea, and land transportation. As I mentioned, mainly from WHO, Paco, cargo. Most of them is medical equipment, personal protective equipment. Uh, using our tool, the WP Emergency Service Marketplace, uh, our UNHRD services, also WP Pilot services provision. What I mean on bilateral service provision is, for example, uh, if we have any office in the region and some 
new and agency needs support from us, we can have an, uh, through the bilateral service provision, we can provide the services and some partnerships. Uh, partnerships, for example, in the recent, just in July, we have a, a, a partnership with the, with the Canadian government using the Royal Canadian Air Forces. The Royal Canadian Air Forces deployed a team here in, to Panama, and so they provide the, the airplane, the staff, the handling, so, and we, were, we sent uh, cargo to five countries and redistributing to additional uh, 10, 10 to 11 islands in the Caribbean. Globally, through these services, WP has reached 161 countries just for COVID, COVID, COVID uh, response. And the total cargo that we have dispatched uh, is 44,654 cubic meters. It's a lot. You know, per personal protective equipment is a volumetric, a volumetric uh, uh, cargo. It's not a, like, a, like a, it's heavy, but it takes a lot of space. I will show you some pictures over there that you will see how's our warehouse. We have around, right now we have like uh, 1,200 cubic meters in cargo so that we have to redistribute to, the, to some other countries in the region. For the type of cargo that we have dispatched, as you can see, 80, 83% it's essential COVID items. Uh, personal protective equipment, diagnostics equipment, and clinic, clinic, uh, clinical care equipment. The rest is other health items and humanitarian items. But the main core of this is are these three categories. Measures on transnational deliveries. That's a, a good question. I love it. Uh, we have to do a lot of, of new, new things constantly. We have to do a lot of warehouse disinfections, uh, the screening procedures, I, well, screening procedures are all over the place, but we have to take a, a good control here uh, on protocols because we can become what I call, we can get aside if we can face one COVID uh, positive patient here because the team will be uh, for sure in quarantine and then we will have to put another team on board to, to continue with the operations. Uh, cargo manipulations, as I mentioned, we have to augment the, the team so they can have all the, the procedures, customs agreements, uh, space for cargo reception and transshipment warehouses. Uh, as I mentioned, most of the cargo is volumetric, so, so we need space. What we did locally here is that we have an agreement with the Panamanian government and they extended our previous warehouse it's a, a hangar from the U.S. forces of 7,400 square meters and uh, they extended up to December 31st and with a possibility of extension uh, to use it just for COVID related activities. Once we have this, this agreement, of course, we needed equipment because as, as, as I mentioned, we were moving 3,000 3, uh, 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 cubic meters in two weeks. So we need equipment, we need uh, staff, we need trucks, we need all the assets to move the, 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 the stocks and redistribute it. This is the, the current, this is a new warehouse where I'm currently sitting. And this is the, the uh, hangar where we have capacity of 7,400 uh, square meters. And this is the transshipment area. For example, as you can see there are some, some drawings at the floor. It's, it's for each container or shipment. So we can segregate all the cargo by, by country. This is the staging area. Uh, also, well, during this, 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 this crisis is, uh, well, how many, how many, how many uh, crises uh, have we coordinated here? Well, well, what, what, what I'll explain under, under my CV, a lot of during since Sandy to the present, but uh, this one has an especial, an especial uh, significance for us because it's not an emergency of one single country. This is a global emergency. This, this has affected everyone in every place. So we have, we ha uh, we have to do our best to ensure this type Get a success. 
this is this is the, the hangar that we, as you can see, there's a lot of PPEs here. This is the, the photos from from the Canadian from the Canadian Air Force when they were arriving. Some cargo dispatched to Barbados. This is the way how we were in coordination with them uh, doing the air pallets, and this is the aircraft, the the Globemaster three that they bring us here for the distribution in the region. Uh, this is Operation Glove, that it was called Operation Glove. And this is the team that was behind all this, this operation. We move through these aircraft around 900 cubic meters in cargo uh, through the regional islands. So we went from Panama to Honduras. We have two, two, two rotations to Honduras, one rotation Tobago, one rotation to, to Barbados, one for St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and two rotations for Guatemala. And thanks. I think I think uh, 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 thanks for the for the for hearing me. I don't know if you <laughs> have any any. Well, I will see later on the questions or or anything uh, related to the COVID. Really, uh, Thank you so much, Francisco. I actually had the greatest pleasure of visiting the depot in Panama, the new one and the old one, and it was an incredible experience to see um, how much cargo um, that you have to coordinate. And, and it's really amazing to the work that you guys do over there. Um, our next speaker, will be Desiree Mayar Salines speaking on the Central American migration crisis. Desiree has worked across different cultures, organizations and functions in France, Argentina, Nicaragua and Mexico for the past 10 years. She is passionate about health, nonviolence and social justice. And she has made a shift in her career to develop strategies for social changes and models to assist the migrants and asylum seekers in the Southern border of Mexico. As the Vulnerable Groups Coordinator at La Santa de Dos, Shelter for Migrants, Asylum Seekers, and Refugees in Tenosique, Tabasco, Mexico, she ensures the psychosocial interventions are covering the residents' needs and overviews the daily life, acti life activities inside the shelter and its different modules with women and children, the LGBTQ plus community, unaccompanied minors, and men. Active participation, autonomy, and self-determination of the residents most of whom are survivors of trauma, is at the core of her work at La Setenta y Dos. Desiree is a French citizen with a master's in science and management from the Emilion Business School and has additional training in psychosocial care and nonviolent communication. Desiree, uh, it's your turn now. Thank you very much and uh, hello everybody. So I'm really honored for the opportunity to shed light on the situation in the south border of Mexico and also on the lives of the migrants, asylum seekers and refugees here in Mexico. So um, I don't know if everybody knows uh, La 72, the 72 shelter. So um, it's a shelter that is uh, 40 miles away from the Guatemala border. It's in the state of Tabasco. And uh, in a normal year, let's say that we receive between uh, 50, 15,000 to 20,000 person uh, per year. So we see uh, many people coming from the Northern Triangle of um, Central America coming and also from Cuba, Haiti uh, and other countries. So we provide all those services and assistance um, regardless of the immigration status. Everybody is welcome uh, in the shelter and as long as they need it, there is no time limit. And um, we have um, the presence of uh, Médecins Sans Frontières inside the shelter that are helping us um, and the migrants with all the mental and physical health services. And we have our own desk with lawyer for the um, 
all the orientation on immigration options for victims of crimes in Mexico and also for um, starting all the immigration legal process for asylum seeker. And uh, we give the person uh, a legal representation. So um, talking uh, more about the immigration um, flows uh, since the COVID-19 started, I would like to, well, state about um, different flows we've uh, observed. So uh, during March and April, uh, we've seen an inverted flow, meaning that the people were coming from north to south, uh, going back to their uh, countries. And uh, this was a sometime voluntary, but most of the time it was a forced uh, migration as the immigration office in Mexico was uh, dropping the people back at the border. Um, then during the month of May and June, there were almost no flow. Um, and uh, starting in July, the um, immigration flow starting again from south to north. So this is important because um, we're not used to see an inverted flow and we're not used to no flow. What happened is that um, people had uh, many difficulties to cross uh, the different countries. Uh, it's not only the fear of the COVID-19, but also a real difficulty to cross, for example, their own country and also uh, Guatemala or El Salvador. So um, this has uh, stopped the flow during um, two months. Um, so what happened uh, inside the shelter? So we decided um, to lock down the shelter um, on March 23rd. It was a really hard decision, but uh, we believed it was the best um, to avoid a massive uh, contagion of um, COVID-19. So we locked down the, refu the shelter with uh, 150 person. And nowadays there is a um, 50 person left in the, refu in the shelter as many person um, decided to step out or to continue their um, route in Mexico as their uh, condition as a refugee was recognized. Also um, telling you that even if we had this uh, lockdown, we uh, had to reaccommodate the space um, to be able to receive new person in quarantine, 14 days quarantine, uh, before they can access uh, the shelter main um, facility and services. And we also had another a third space for a person to stay two or three days uh, with um, a minimum uh, space to rest, to be secure, and also to receive food and uh, toilets and showers. Um, then in June, we had a positive case of COVID. Um, so we had to isolate the person and uh, we were really glad that uh, there was no complication on the health of this person, but all of the shelter was uh, suspicious. So we had to stop uh, receiving a person and stop um, giving access to food and shelter. It was really a hard decision on the team because it's already stressful. We are not a lot of people working in the shelter. A um, lot of our work is done by volunteers. Uh, volunteer also, uh, a lot of them decided to get back to their home or also were uh, afraid not to be able to go back home because of the border closing. So we were not a lot of people and it's a hard decision to shut 
uh, down the door on people outside of the shelter uh, because, uh, well, they, there is many risk uh, for them outside of the shelter. So we had to close completely for uh, three to four weeks. And uh, once we were um, sure that we had uh, no risk of COVID, we opened again the shelter for um, food and uh, hygiene um, uh, services and uh, since one week we are starting to receive the people also for uh, the night uh, sleeping on mats um, so what um, what happened with uh, covid 19 is that um, we perfectly know that uh, well it's not only for us um, important to design routes and protocol and also uh, empower the migrant and asylum um, seeker on their own on, on their health but also uh, we are we know that if one of the migrants or uh, asylum seeker gets sick uh, we will have to take care of him uh, inside the shelter. So it's a big responsibility because we know that the health system in the Tabasco and in Tenosique nearby the refuge, the shelter is not really good. So we are aware of this responsibility. So um, this is um, really important for us to be careful and uh, work as safely as possible. And um, as uh, we had less uh, person in the house, um, a positive uh, point was uh, that the migrant found a more stable place to be. And um, uh, we could also access to let's say more personalized uh, services and uh, assistance in their legal and also health, uh, mental and physical health um, needs. So this is a positive point of this um, decrease in the immigration flow. Uh, we know it's a small um, window in the massive immigration flow, but we had the, um, the possibility um, to, I believe, um, assist better um, the people that were uh, inside the shelter. Also, it's important that the COMAR, it's the Mexican Commission to Assist Refugee and also the Immigration Office, uh, in Tenosique, uh, both offices were running. So they were not um, receiving uh, personally um, the migrants and asylum seeker, but they were still um, uh, accepting the procedures and uh, also um, well, they were also dictated on um, the refugee condition. So um, this is really important because the person uh, were not um, losing time, let's say it this way, because sometimes uh, asylum seekers uh, are really frustrated when they see their, um, they have no response from the government or from the immigration office on their procedures. So, um, Maybe there were less contact with officer, but uh, they were able to um, do their procedure. And um, well, let's say that's for the people uh, inside the shelter where there, we have an attorney um, that have the legal representation. The problem uh, and difficulty is for the people that are outside the shelter uh, living uh, in the community of Tenosique or just um, 
um, arriving in the community that they had uh, almost uh, no contact with the protection officer of uh, this Mexican commission. So they were it was harder for them to get uh, information and also um, to know their rights. So that was uh, a problem uh, for the people that uh, don't have any legal representation or assistance on their procedures. Um, then um, I would like to say that um, also um, in the south uh, border of uh, Mexico, uh, most of the migrants that arrived to Mexico uh, hope to travel and cross the country through uh, with the train, uh, a cargo train that is called the Beast. It's uh, well known, it's crossing all Mexico and it has different roads. Well, this train uh, stopped to operate in uh, Tabasco at the beginning of August. So now the people that are arriving in the um, in the south border um, in uh, Tenosique, they don't really know how to move north. So um, I believe this is gonna be, have a big impact as the people are staying longer uh, in the south and uh, we don't know yet what will happen. Uh, we don't know if they will um, maybe uh, uh, change their strategy. We don't. Uh, we think that maybe more person are gonna be um, asking for the refugee condition here in Mexico because uh, it's harder to travel north. Or if they're gonna take another road, maybe enter Mexico um, in Chiapas and uh, maybe the immigration flows are gonna change in the next uh, month. We don't know yet um, how it will affect. Um, something else I would like to say about uh, COVID-19, even if we've seen the um, immigration flows to decrease and almost stopped in May and June, uh, well, also many shelter had to close in Mexico, uh, sometimes because of state regulation. So it has been um, really difficult for the migrant and asylum seeker to well, find a safe place uh, to be and also to, um, uh, to uh, receive, um, well, um, assistance on their uh, legal procedures. Um, also the consular offices were closed, so that's another problem. And um, we uh, also experienced that some programs uh, from the UN uh, Refugee Agency, like for example, the resettlement program in Mexico, that targeted uh, people that are recognized as refugee uh, was on hold. So um, people don't have any visibility on what's coming next. And uh, they also know it's gonna be harder for them to find a job. So this is um, what has been happening um, for us in the shelter. Well, we had, um, we were lucky to receive extra humanitarian aid um, with uh, extra um, with new projects um, due to COVID-19 for food and also uh, cleansing and personal hygiene uh, stuff from uh, some uh, local and also international organization. So we were not out of uh, stock. So that was good because uh, we could still offer uh, food and um, be sure that uh, the um, um, health protocols are um, completed in uh, the shelter. Uh, what else I would like to tell you? Um, well, maybe, um, 
Well, asking for some uh, uh, help. I don't know if uh, <laughs> I can talk about that now. Um, but um, we are, let's say, an independent shelter. Uh, we are trying to um, receive um, the, what we need and uh, trying to uh, respond on the needs of the migrants, uh, asylum seeker and refugee that live in the house. But we're not uh, receiving lots of humanitarian aid from big uh, interna international agency. That's um, that's a political decision of the shelter. Um, but uh, we believe there is a lot of um, people uh, willing to help and smaller agencies. And uh, well, as we have uh, many attendees, maybe ask. Uh, if there is people that want to be a volunteer and come and work in the shelter for one month or maybe six months, uh, you're welcome. And also, if some uh, person wants to help us to give some uh, press coverage or visibility um, on the work of the shelter, but mostly on the lives of the migrants in Mexico, uh, you are also welcome to contact the shelter and uh, any donation is uh, welcome. So I will be glad to well, talk further with uh, who, whoever is interested in uh, participating. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> you, sorry. Thank you so much, Desiree, for your overview on the work that you do in Mexico and with the migrants. I wasn't aware about the inverted flow of migrants. That was something new that I have learned. Um, and now we will continue to, for our next speaker. Our next speaker will be Jean Nicolas Bous speaking on the Yemen humanitarian crisis. Jean Nicolas has worked for close to 23 years with the United Nations in civil society in the areas of human rights, peacekeeping, and child protection and education in, at headquarters and also in the field in Cameroon, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, Afghanistan, and in further areas in the Middle East and in the North African region. He joined the UNHCR in Lebanon in 2013, and he joined the, its U Yemeni operation in 2020, where he leads the response on Yemeni displaced by the conflict, including through one of UNHCR's largest cash programs. In addition to having worked on emergency responses in Iraq, Libya, and Syria, he has specialized in the protection of civilians in international humanitarian law, transitional justice, torture, women's rights, elections, rule of law, and poverty eradication. So Jean Nicolas, it is you have the floor now. So Jean Nicolas, I don't know. Can you hear us? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ariel, and uh, very happy to have joined. Yeah. Yep, we so, can hear you now. Thank you very much, uh, Ariel, and I'm very happy to, to join uh, this panel. Uh, we, we, we were partners in crime with Rachel when I was in, in Canada to highlight a bit the situation that uh, Desiree was mentioning, which is a, a much focus uh, of um, dire consequences uh, on an individual uh, uh, basis. And I'm, I'm pleased to, to meet uh, Francisco from uh, WFP, who is indeed, his organization is really the backbone of, um, of what we are able to do in terms of bringing supply and material to uh, places like Yemen. Um, I wanted to touch upon three uh, main issues uh, of what, from the ground, I've realized COVID-19 may be changing. And, the way we are doing business. And I think uh, everything I'm going to say is again the backdrop of what Re Rachel said and all the very fair criticism that you made about the way uh, humanitarian uh, uh, action is being conceived and rolled on 
the ground. Um, so all the caveat uh, that uh, Rachel mentioned uh, should be kept in mind when I do this uh, presentation, or that I share my thought. It's not really a presentation. So the first thing um, which is really important to remember is that as humanitarian, and thanks Ariel for having uh, uh, reminded us of this definition, we will never put ourselves in danger. Humanitarians are not cowboys, are not uh, mercenaries, are not people who are ready to risk their life uh, with the life of others. We will always mitigate the risk. And for example, uh, on a purely security point of view in a country like um, uh, Yemen, we will never go too close to an active front line or to a place where we know uh, can be bombed because a dead humanitarian is a useless humanitarian. Sorry, that may not sound really good the way I say it, but uh, this is the reality. So the, the, one of the challenges with COVID-19 has been how do we protect our own colleagues so that we can maintain those life-saving intervention, which requires, as Desiree has mentioned, interaction in the communities with people who do not have the means to um, curve, how do you curve of coronavirus? When coronavirus hit um, Yemen, like when it um, hit uh, La, uh, Latin America and a shelter like uh, La 72, um, people had very little means to protect themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the people in Yemen don't have running water, so they cannot wash their hands regularly. Most of the people will not choose to buy soap if they have little money and they need to feed their children. Stay at home is a completely useless concept in a country like Yemen. People rely on the money they get during the day to feed their children at night. There's no money at the bank and there's no money under the mattress and there's no social uh, safety net provided by uh, the authority. So in this context, how do you decide to send your colleagues in communities where you know that the coronavirus is probably spreading very fast and, and without any uh, means to, to really protect people. That has meant that we needed to really change our way of working. So I'm starting with what Francisco uh, clearly explained. We needed to buy supply. Of course, in Yemen, nobody was wearing masks, nobody was wearing gloves to do anything, uh, I mean, except the medical staff, but to do anything in relation to our humanitarian intervention. Where do we find the gloves? Where do we find the, um, the, 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 the mask? How many do I need? How do I compete with the US and Europe and next to me, Saudi Arabia, a uh, very rich country, which is going to look for exactly the same mask and gloves. Me, little uh, humanitarian organization, even if I'm uh, representing a big one, compared to government in the Western world who were buying massively all those uh, uh, items. How do we ensure, as Francisco mentioned, that they arrive on time with blockage due to visa, to clearance, security clearance, when you have systematically UDATA port, which is one of the entry points, which is bombed. Or do we, you pass uh, probably, I don't know how many checkpoints between the port and the warehouse, and another series of checkpoints between the warehouse and the communities that you want uh, to receive those masks, or even your own staff in UNHCR. So what, what, what measures do you take to do distribution of emergency shelter kits? People get displaced every day by the conflict in, in Yemen. Um, some of the colleagues decide, uh, decided to, to use door-to-door -door distribution. It takes four times more time to do it than a regular distribution. Can you afford it? Do you have enough staff? Do you have multiple interaction with people uh, get them in fact to be. So all things were the child had to, to address. One of the things I want to point out is on protection. My background is on human rights and, and Rachel and Desiree as well. We know that a number of our 
intervention requires a face-to-face. -face. You are not going to interview by inter uh, through a VTC a rape survivor. First, the rape survivor doesn't have a computer, doesn't have the internet, will not, even if they had that, will never trust a link uh, over internet when rape survivors are considered guilty in a society like here and for bringing allegedly shame on the community and be subjected to so-called honor killings. How do you speak to a child who may have been uh, subjected to domestic violence or who may be at risk of being possibly married at a very young age or who may be um, in this arm group? This really to establish an interaction. How do Sure, Nicola. Do that when it's you a, need to make between you. Sure, Nicola, it's a bit hard yeah. to hear you. It's a bit hard to hear you, so maybe better if you turn off your video. Maybe that'll help with your audio. Yeah, and let me cut the video. So I was saying that there is uh, uh, all the elements of adapting in terms of distribution and that we can do to some extent, door to door rather than group distribution. But when it comes to the uh, core of our mandate, the protection work, it requires individual inter interaction, face to face. You need to establish a contact with the person in a safe space for that person, a child, a rape survivor, an elderly person, a person with disability, to be able to share a need and, and what needs to be done. In the context of COVID, that was quite a challenge because how do you do that? We are not going to do that be, behind the plexiglass. We are not at a bank. We are, we are not going to do that with uh, two or three meters between the people. People break into tears. It's very difficult not, uh, in many instances, not to have a, a gestures to reassure the person uh, in front of which you are. So those were the dilemma that we had in terms of uh, the modalities of the intervention in the time of COVID. The second point is related to a point that uh, Rachel made about uh, uh, resources and funding. Uh, currently, the response, humanitarian response plans in Yemen is funded at the level of 23%. That means that we can, in realistic manner, is, uh, uh, assist only one person out of four, which is in need of a shelter, of a vaccine, of going to school, of receiving food, or so on and so forth. We have only one out of four of the dollars that we need to do a proper response in Yemen. On top of that, you add COVID, which requires additional funding, which were not in, uh, in the pipeline, which we had not been advocating for or fundraised for. And here I'm going to um, ask a, an ethical question. In a country where people die every day from cholera, chikungunya, malaria, and other disease. In a country where people get bombed every other day. In a country where 80% of the population relies on external aid to survive. Where most people will eat only once a day and it's probably going to be bread and tea with sugar. How do you decide to suddenly prioritize the response to COVID-19 when you know that there is no cure, there is no treatment, it's not that you can buy medication, when you know that it requires a change in social behavior that you know will not happen because stay at home does not work in a country like Yemen, Wash your hands regularly does not work in a country like Yemen because there's not enough access to running water. How do you decide in your conscience to say suddenly I'm going to divert my money for rape survivor, my money for food, 
my money for emergency shelter for people who have lost their house in the bombing to suddenly uh, buy soap and, uh, and, um, and masks. So we had really some tough discussion within the team of knowing what is the best option for us to protect the population from COVID-19. And our solution was to give them cash. So that in a way they can decide on their own how to prioritize uh, their protection against uh, COVID-19, that eventually they can limit their movement in search of uh, daily jobs, usually uh, badly paid job, that at least if a member of the family and potentially the breadwinner fell sick to COVID, they could still continue uh, feeding themselves or paying rent or buying clothes. And that was a bit the, the solution that we thought was the most dignified and the most realistic to do in, in the context of Yemen, which is totally different uh, from the context that, for example, Ray, Rachel uh, mentioned with the um, indigenous community in the northern of Canada, where you have probably uh, a wider range of options um, in front of you. So it's, it's really the question of how do you prioritize suddenly uh, for a pandemic for which there is no, at least at the beginning, no real solution to make sure that people will be fully protected, except so a change of social behavior, which was not going to happen and which is not actually happening at all in Yemen. The last point is something that Desiree just mentioned in a, in a presentation, is that for the first time, I think, and Rachel um, who with me, on the panel is a bit the, the seniors on, on this panel may, may, may perhaps um, um, contradict me, but I think it's the first time that for us, international humanitarians, we were confronted with having to deal with an issue which was also affecting our loved one at home. And there was really a loyalty issue for us. Do I stay and continue to do my work? in Yemen, or do I rush to my elderly mother who may be similarly in need of my support during the COVID coronavirus pandemic? It's interesting because it highlights the fact that our national colleagues have been facing that times and again. When the bomb drops on Sanaa a few years back, and they still, uh, they still drop regularly on Sana, but uh, thankfully not on, uh, on, on us. But the inter international community packed and go. The national colleagues stayed behind at the risk of getting a bomb on their house. But on, at eight o'clock in the morning, they will be at the distribution site. They will be in the office listening to the stories of the displaced family. So for us, uh, international staff, we always have the possibility when it's getting too hot to leave the country. And I understand the way that some people, volunteers, may have decided not to stay in the shelter, but actually go back home and help their, 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 their loved one, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a really interesting dilemma, which may change a little bit uh, the way we function in the future. And here comes the, the infamous telecommuting. We have been bombarded, especially on social media by all uh, tech companies and many uh, businesses on how wonderful it is to telecommute. To which extent can we do our humanitarian work from remote? To which extent are we going to be obliged to adapt the way we do our business because of the risk of the coronavirus. We had to reduce from 40 international staff, we reduced to five because colleagues, a number of them didn't cope very well with what was happening. And I fully understand. They were getting news that their child or their spouse uh, were getting sick at home. They all wanted to leave. So what does that mean? And, 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 and 
on, on top of that, some didn't want to stay because as mentioned also, I think by Desiree, a country like Yemen does not have any um, medical capacity to take care of us or the population if we fall sick. The only way is medical evacuation. So I think I will leave you with this, uh, this last thought, which is uh, one of what does that mean to be a humanitarian when suddenly the humanitarian needs may be comparable and I put a big quotation mark here because I still think there's no comparison between facing COVID in Yemen and facing COVID in uh, New York or, or Montreal. But, but to some extent, there is a question to be asked when the needs are also at home. The humanitarian or protection or public health needs are also at home. And that has been critical in our discussion with the donors, for example, who have clearly said, we need to think of our own public health system. We need to think of the socioeconomic impact on our own citizen back home. Why do you want us to bet on Yemen? Why do you want to, us to put this money against Yemen? Here, yeah, my response has always been, but I'm, I'm happy to hear uh, comments from others. There is, of course, an ethical responsibility to help the most vulnerable, and I really strongly believe in it. Whether you do it for religious, philosophical, uh, human rights, or other principles, each of us may be moved by something different. But in the COVID-19, there's also a self-preservation uh, interest for Western countries to bet on a country like Yemen. Because nobody will be safe from the coronavirus if not everyone is safe from the coronavirus. And countries like Bangladesh, uh, South Sudan, uh, maybe, uh, maybe Latin, some countries in Latin America and definitely Yemen are our weakest link in the global fight against the pandemic. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Jean-Nicolas, especially for the last thought um, and question that you gave us. I'm sure it'll leave many of us to think. And then also for the overview of what you, of what, of the crisis that Yemenis are facing, especially with COVID-19. I want to now open the floor for some questions. If you're in the Zoom chat, you can use the raise the, your hand feature and we can call on you and unmute your mic. If you're not comfortable with that, uh, you can also message a question in the chat. Um, that can be read out loud. And then if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, you can put a question in that uh, chat box, those chat boxes as well. So I'm not sure if we will have a question, um, but one question that I do have is how, where, and this can be for anyone to answer, where do you guys look for your hope and your positivity while working in such a desolate and negative situation, especially with the pandemic right now? I can I can make a start, um, and I think you know whether it's a pandemic or any of these uh, humanitarian crises. I think for me, where I always find the hope and what keeps me going is the the, the humanity, the the people that I meet, the people who are able to get up in the morning, start their day, try to get on, to look after their families, to move forward, who come with a smile to, uh, to whatever they're doing, um, always reaching out a hand one to the other, helping their neighbors. And I think that, you know, is really what I think we need to, to hold on to. I mean, you know, humanity, the solidarity from one human being to another. And I think the, the tragic things that I see when I look at things like, you know, the racism, the Black Lives Matter and how that's, and the divisions that there are in our societies. I think that this humanity that we see on the ground in these emergency situations is really um, a, 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 a kind of a reminder, you know, of how 
we need to hang on to that and how important it is if we are to, to move forward and that we need to address these crises of, of racism and so on that are really cleaving our societies apart and it's really urgent to do that. Um, so that's where I get my hope from. Thank you so much. We have a chat, uh, a question, sorry, um, from Gawa. So I'm going to unmute her um, and spotlight Thank her you. video. Thank you, Arielle, and, and heartfelt congrats. This has been terrifically stimulating. And uh, of course, my dear friend, Jean-Nicolas, to use your expression, we, we were partners in crime in Jordan and, and our dear Lebanon. Uh, so, so interesting to hear all of you speak, uh, um, Desiree, Rochelle, of course, and we're both living in Montreal. I hope we get to meet sometime. And Francisco, I spent 23 years in, in WFP. So all of this is just getting my mind buzzing with ideas. And of course, since COVID struck, it, it's, it's virtually impossible to deliver the kind of assistance we've been doing. We've been talking about reform for years. I spent a good part of my career, three decades in the UN system. And we reform regularly, we reassess, we see how we can better do things. And sometimes we, we do succeed marvelously. In Lebanon, we had the largest uh, uh, sort of ATM uh, delivery system using, using cards for people to, to purchase uh, 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 humanitarian assistance, food and non-food items. Uh, and it's being used now again during this horrific crisis in Lebanon. My question, which I'm not sure can be answered <laughs> in, in a brief way, but Rochelle, how can we get the system to change? How can we focus? I don't want to use the word resilience, but how can we strengthen uh, the, and I just said the word because I know it's, it's been a buzzword for quite some time, but how can we get the people whom we serve to be the ones in the lead? I was based in Yemen in 93, and we thought the worst thing that happened was that civil war in 94. Look what's going on now. The, the, the heads of our agencies in the, in the late 90s went to the UN Security Council and says, we need more money for security. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars to secure our staff and, and, and in buying uh, um, uh, armored cars and getting security officers trained and training staff. I mean, Jean-Nicolas was mentioning not being able to get masks and, 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 uh, and gloves. Of course, I mean, we had a problem here in Montreal. So I, I can imagine that for Yemen, it, it couldn't have been easy to make sure that your staff is well prepared, but how could we get the machinery of the international community? Now for the first time since I was involved in this business uh, of international development and humanitarian assistance to, who, who are suffering with the exact same problems and throwing billions of dollars at, at temporary solutions, not even long-term solutions for their own countries. Yet, of course, they had the heart and the interest to rush to Lebanon a couple of weeks ago and, and WP's in the lead in, in fixing the port and doing all that, all very good in an emergency situation. But long-term, the international staff is, are clearly, as, as Jean-Nicolas mentioned, are worried about their families at home. They suffer the same issues. How can we get communities? And I congratulate on what, what you're doing in the Inuit communities here in Canada, uh, Rochelle, but how can we get the movement, a movement going to get the international community to think along those lines? It's high time that we not be the only leaders in, in foreign countries that are continuously struggling against man-made and humanitarian disasters. I know it's a big question, but it's been, I've been grappling with it since COVID as you all have been. Um, and if anybody has a quick answer or any ideas, um, I'd be I'd be interested to hear them. Thank you very much, and congratulations again, Ariel. It's, this is wonderful. Thanks, Ariel. I don't mind taking a quick stab since uh, go ahead. <laughs> but if someone else wants to come in, please, if you like, shall I go ahead? Oh, I can maybe just say one small thing uh, and obviously it's uh, like a really uh, local and context centered uh, comment I guess uh, from the shelter well 
we have uh, been thinking a lot like the not only now because of the COVID-19 but um, in uh, the past year how do we look at the beneficiaries uh, how do we look at the residents of the shelter and um, how do we sometime um, as a humanitarian well in our case we uh, I believe it's more like a human right uh, fight sometime <laughs> um, but um, how can we sometime uh, repeat some systemic violence um, in um, the way we look at the beneficiary and the way we attend their needs? Uh, it's a philosophical debate, but um, really we've been thinking what kind of tool uh, we give the beneficiary. How do we empower them? Um, are we looking at them as a population of uh, vulnerable groups or individuals with different needs? So um, that's uh, really an important question. And inside the shelter, it's really hard to do that. It would be really easier to have some other dynamics. But we're trying to work with an active participation of the beneficiary inside the shelter. And this really gives uh, more dignity to the person and they understand the rights and um, they start to understand how to deal with their own process, how to deal with their health. And um, I think this is really important. Uh, how do we look at them? Because um, yes, we can bring a lot of assistance, medical, uh, mental health, legal assistance but if we do everything for them we give them i don't know a pill because they're not feeling good and they don't even know what is it because they're not used to ask for that for that or we do all the paperwork for them obviously they're not going to get empowered and um so that's uh, really important because sometimes it's easier to do it like that or it's easier to have somebody with a lot of uh, authority to define the norms in the in the shelter uh, it's harder to work and create community and commission to work in the kitchen to work for the safety to work inside each uh, spaces so they can live properly and with dignity this um, this is a lot more work human work but i think it gives a lot of dignity to the person and uh, I don't know when somebody work in a big agency, how they can do that. And, um, but I think when we work uh, directly with the person, well, I only see the work of the big agency here in uh, Tabasco, but um, we don't work the same way. And I understand because our work are totally different. So we don't have the same, um, um, uh, assistant, we don't assist the person the same way. But uh, I really would like to say that if we are talking about social justice, and uh, we also have to, as individual uh, working in humanitarian or human rights context, to think about uh, why we're working there and how do we see the beneficiary. I think it's a way to empower the person. And in the COVID um, situation, we had a little person working in the shelter and uh, really the beneficiary, they were working more and more, like, uh, for example, helping us with all the humanitarian work, giving food uh, to the people outside the, the house. And they were really... Uh, happy to contribute and we didn't have to ask for that so um, I think I have a lot of hope and uh, the human side and the solidarity but we have to look at the beneficiary this way that's the only way I think but well, that's only my opinion and on the context I am can I can I just add very short on this yes. because I, I think just 
to take the Delphine's thing out to a bigger level, what you're basically saying is the system we have is very paternalistic. It's, uh, you know, it's got its roots in colonialism. It brings up all these issues of racism. We see the sexual violence and so on. So to answer your question, Gawaha, we have to go bottom up. We cannot rely on the UN to be able to do granular, community-based individual actions. So we just need to change our approach in Mexico with communities who have no support from anyone. And they are able to empower themselves and they are the best people to be in control of their futures. And this mm -hmm. stuff is not rocket science. It's not rocket science to wear a mask and to clean your hands. But people need the materials to do that. But, but everyone's so on the big stuff that everyone forgets the little community who just doesn't have any face masks and they're being told to socially distance. I know I have to stop. Sorry, Ariane. Yeah, no, it, that's a very, very good answer. And it definitely brings up a lot of starting we have another question um, from Stephanie Rukin from Solace University in London. Her question is, what role do you think us as humanitarian actors have in contributing to structural violence? So is maybe like Francisco or Jean Nicolas want to take a stab at it? Any one of our other panelists want to try and answer? Just, just to reiterate the point that uh, Rachel was making, and and and, and, and which is uh, goes down to the question of Gawaer, uh, which is really, um, do we have the right system in place to empower people to be agents of change within their own communities without having to rely on us uh, constantly and more and more? Uh, um, uh, for their survival. I mean, it's, it's a basic thing. Uh, learn somebody to fish rather than giving uh, them a fish. But as Gawaira has said, easier said than done. And we have inherited, at least in the UN system, but I think, unfortunately, the INGOs and to some extent, even the local NGOs have inherited of a system which is fundamentally not putting uh, the communities or the individual at the center of this um, change. We bring the change, and it's wrong. This is not the way it should, it should happen. People should be given the tools for them to change and to adapt to the context uh, um, and to their, their wishes. Where there is a problem with this approach, and perhaps Desiree will join me on that, is that you risk undermining the universality of human rights. Because in a country like Yemen, if you say to the Houthi, uh, um, okay, establish the system, the, the political system, the accountability system, the economic system that you want, I'm never going to meet any single Yemeni woman, for example, because they will all be uh, pushed into their, their kitchen. So, but I, I, I think this is really at the core, and, and, and I can see that for you, uh, generation, um, Ariel and, and the others on this line, you are going to come to the issues with a completely different mindset. We inherited, Rachel, Gawair, uh, and myself, of a system, a paternalistic, paternalistic system out of the Second World War of recognizing that we had completely fucked up, and suddenly we were going to become the white saviors and, uh, and, and, and bring change and bring human rights and bring uh, liberal economies and bring pros uh, prosperity and so on. I think your generation, Ariel, and, and probably most of the people on the, on the call uh, will come to this issue with a completely different um, uh, philosophy. And it's really a, a, a shift in the philosophy of how uh, we help each other and we help the planet. Thank you so much. That was a great answer. We have one final um, question by uh, Delphine. Let me just unmute her. Okay, Delphine. Hello. Thank you so much for the great talk, Ariel, and everyone who is speaking. Um, yeah, I found it really interesting, Jean Nicola, the questions that you brought up, um, especially like in the context of Yemen, but also I was speaking with um, a woman working 
with AIN um, in Lebanon, uh, the fact that, you know, the pandemic is really like the last, the least of problems for some countries. Um, in Lebanon, they had the October Revolution, the economic crisis, and now the blast. So really, the pandemic is like in the background of all that. Um, and so she was saying how a lot of informal groups, like, you know, non-funded informal uh, groups and NGOs kind of emerged during that whole um, period. Um, and also, I was thinking how after the blast, a lot of social media was saying that um, it was important to not give money to the government and we had to make sure we were donating to, you know, the, the Red Cross and things like that. So in a way that we didn't help fund the government, but really helped the community um, or, you know, organizations that were really going to help at the uh, um, bottom up level. So I was kind of wondering how do you, as, you know, humanitarian aid actors, how do you reconcile the need for aid, you know, to deliver aid, with, um, you know, when it's like official, fun officially funded NGOs like the UN and things like that, that have to go through the government, um, and through the national leaders, how how do you reconcile that? Because, uh, you know, if that's the only way to kind of be present in that country as official humanitarian actors, but doing so through the official channel kind of worsens the situation in a way. I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but um, yeah, how do you, is it through the community first approach where you try to empower, um, smaller informal groups or do you still go to I don't know, major organizations like the UN? I don't know if any of you had some comment on that. Very, very briefly, you know, Rachel mentioned the, the World Humanitarian Summit a few years ago and there was really a commitment uh, to shift gears in terms of, um, uh, of partnership. Of course, there are things that you need the, part, the, the government counterpart. If you need to change the fiscal policies so that the taxes that are uh, uh, being taken from the population benefit the public health system, the, the, the education system. For example, DRC, for the first time where Rachel and myself worked, has made a, a school free of charge for the parents major change. Of course, in those instances, you need to work with the government to be able to help them put a system of a free school uh, for everyone. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the Humanitarian Summit, we also committed to shift gears and bet more, uh, that is the wrong word, but part, uh, partner more with national and local NGOs. And for example, here in Yemen, um, I think UNHCR, but it's true from, for WFP and UNICEF and the others, we work 90% with local NGOs. It's not without any risk, because if you are a national NGO in a country like Yemen, you probably have some political views about the different parties in the conflict. You probably have affiliation. So you take also a risk with the, nation, uh, the national N uh, NGOs. One thing which has changed radically, and Gawair mentioned it in, in Lebanon, but now it has expanded everywhere, it's the use of cash. Cash as a modality of intervention. Cash as a, a, a chance for people to choose what they want to do. If they want this month to buy clothes for their kids, or rather put money for, for better quality food, or whether it's time for uh, repairing the house or building a new space for the elderly parents or, or whatever. But it gives really a choice to, to the people. I, I always warn the new generation of humanitarians, I hope many of you, that uh, cash is not a magic bullet because cash does not buy protection against being raped. Cash does not buy uh, medical care if there is no specialized surgeon uh, for um, uh, rape survivors. Cash doesn't uh, buy you um, an access to a, sh a shelter for uh, survivors of domestic violence. 
If they are known, you, 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 the cash will not help you. But the cash has changed quite a bit in terms of the way we, um, we interact and we empower, in a way, uh, people to, to choose and decide how they spend the money. But ultimately, we need, and, and that is a much more um, difficult question, we need to rely on the state. We need to rely on the state because that's the one which provides those public services, quality water, quality education, electricity, and so on and so forth. This is the one where, this is the state, whether we like it or not, which is there to not only protect and respect, but fulfill our human rights. And that's where we will not, uh, I think, uh, uh, I know that a lot of people would like to do without state structure. I don't think we, uh, the human societies are ready for that yet. Yeah, I, I just want to, to come in and, and, and echo what, what uh, Jean-Nicolas is saying. And I, I think it's something very interesting, we do talk a lot about community-led, community-centered, but I don't actually think we know what that means. It's all very nice to say it like, how are you talking about the word, you know, resilience and how it becomes a buzzword. We can't, we, we have, we're such victims of making things buzzwords. Um, and so they lose, I mean, resilience is a fantastic word. But then when you start talking about, you know, like the woman Deba I showed and that she's resilient because she's surviving, this is not resilience for me, she's just surviving. You know, this is, so we've, we've lost the meaning of this word. So community led, I think is also something else that we're really in danger of not understanding what it means. And so when I talk about this community first approach, I'm not just talking about, well, let's do a consultation with the community and see what they think. And then we're going to implement, no, 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 no. It's a complete, it's much more towards what, what Desiree was saying, is how do you go and form a true partnership with a community and that they are identifying their needs, they feel it, empowered to respond and they have the tools to be able to do it and this is where when you talk about money Jean-Nicolas I agree with you but I think that the key change has been instead of what we used to do in the bad old days of food for work you know this kind of like uh, sort of exchange mechanism I mean, horrific when we think back that we actually did that to people but now when we talk about well giving people money so they can make choices this kind of starts to undermine this paternalistic approach of well if we don't if we don't get what you need you're just going to go and spend the money on something that you don't actually need and this whole this requires a fundamental culture shift in the way that we perceive the role of those white saviors. And this is like such a massive change that needs to happen. I think it's really interesting to look, there was an article that came out very recently, kind of horrifying, that ISIS was saying humanitarians are legitimate targets. And if you look at the reasons that they're saying humanitarians are legitimate targets, a lot of it is around, well, they're coming with their Western ideals, they're coming to impose things on us, they're coming to convert us, they're coming to change. And, you know, this is the perception that people have. You know, this is an extreme example, but you have to, you know, I do not understand, despite my X number of years, I can never understand what it is like to be Diba in Bulengo camp. I cannot. I cannot understand. I can never really truly understand what it's like to be a migrant coming from Honduras and arriving at La Cidente Dos. Imagine the fear, you know, the, the cultural, historical baggage, and then the, the racism and the stigmatization. And then COVID is just enhancing and exacerbating all of that. So we have to, it, you know, re empower. It's not even about empowering because communities have power, but it's to re empower them so that they can realize their own inherent power. So I have trouble with the word empower and I can't find a better one to use because I believe it's about communities themselves empowering themselves and how can we come and, and recognize and see communities and really be able to help them to find their way. Wow, that, that was, this whole Q&A uh, session has been so insightful and that closing uh, answers by Rachel and Jean-Nicolas really bring up a lot of thoughts and and humanitarians going forward and the work that how it will evolve and change over time um, and this is only just the beginning of these types of discussions. Um, I know we're over 
by quite some time, but I hope that I can have each panelist um, to close out the webinar very, very briefly, um, just say how us in the audience, what how we can um, help, how we can involve ourselves in our local and our global communities and in the issues that you have all spoken about. So I want to start maybe with Francisco, if you want to go first, and then um, we can do Rachel, Desiree, and then Jean-Nicolas, if that's okay. Um, so Francisco, if you would like to answer first. Yeah, uh, uh, basically, well, my, my, my advice would be, first of all, let's keep the measures on, on all the recommendations that we have, we are really facing um, uh, during this emergency and uh, uh, keep up the strength. On, on, on what we are doing as a, as a humanitarian actors uh, as part of our job. And um, if we do our job as motivated, we we perform for sure, this assistance will, will be uh, reaching our beneficiaries. That's the, that's the priority. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, echoing Francisco, wear your mask, my first comment. Exactly, where's your mask, mister? Yeah, no, no, for everybody on the call, keep wearing masks. It's absolutely critical um, to, to being able to get through this pandemic. Um, and I think um, support vulnerable groups in your own community. You don't need to travel 10,000 miles to another country and uh, some exotic location. Here in Montreal, for anyone who's in Montreal, we have migrant shelters, we have vulnerable communities, we have homeless, we have uh, indigenous people living on the street go out and find out how to help um, and make sure that we're not stigmatizing these people and just reinforcing their marginalization and their isolation. Thank you. Okay. See, thank you, Francisco and Rachel. So I will say the same, like keep taking care of yourself and your family if you can. And uh, also, as, as I said before, uh, if you want to come and volunteer, um, where it's possible and uh, also if you like to uh, see with us uh, if you'd like to donate uh, or uh, help us to um, get um, more visibility of uh, the situation in the south border uh, you're welcome to if you have some uh, ways um, to help uh, pass the words, <laughs> it's really important uh, for us to bring more visibility of the situation. So that's what I can tell you and ask. Thank you very much. Thank you, Desiree. Jean-Nicolas? Vote, 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 especially those who may be on the other side uh, in the US. Don't um, brush off the political process, vote at the local at the national uh, and at the national uh, level. Get involved in politics, get informed, discuss. Don't let things that bother you when you are having a discussion with your teacher or your professor, sorry, not your teacher, your professor, or, or amongst yourself when you think that something um, is, uh, is wrong or is uh, dismissive of a minority, uh, whether gender minority, a sexual uh, uh, minority, a racial minority, a religious minority, stood up for what you believe is right, and the courage to, uh, of your opinion, but get informed, get informed, get involved, demonstrate, participate, write, read, speak, and participate to Ariel's wonderful seminar. Thank you so much, Joan Nicola. And thank you to everyone for attending this webinar. I really hope that we have not only brought attention to the challenges that the humanitarian world is facing, but also the positivity and the hope that every day we have people like our panelists who are committed to their job and their mission to help others. And that also we as the audience, we have a role to play in humanitarian assistance. Um, so thank you so much. Um, if everyone could just go to the reaction sections on the Zoom and do a nice applause just for coming to the webinar and attending and participating. This was a very um, great discussion and I really thank you all for joining me today. If you need to want to learn more, you can always email me at the email that was on the registration form.
So thank you. Thanks, Ariel. Bye. Stay Ariel. safe. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank bye -bye, you all. Bye, bye. Thank you. Thank you.